Let us pray. Give me Jesus, Lord. Give me Jesus. You can have all the rest. Just give me Jesus. Amen. Do you remember way back in the book of Genesis when Adam and Eve were being driven out of the Garden of Eden, God said to them, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until the day you die. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Right there began a view adopted by many people that work is somehow a curse, a punishment, a hateful necessity. Many people in our own time still cling to that ancient view. Their negative attitude toward work is clearly revealed in the work that they do or don't do. I mean, we don't have to look very far these days, do we, to find waiters who will not serve, sales clerks who will not sell, painters who will come around someday, maybe, executives whose minds are always out on the golf course, politicians looking for a quick buck or a painless issue, homemakers trying to find some way to shirk the unpleasantness of housework, parents looking for ways to abdicate their responsibility for their children, students trying to cheat their way through school, businessmen who see their customers as nothing more than sources of revenue, lawyers who seem to care so little for the noble concept of justice, teachers who refuse to study hard in order to enhance their own competence, and preachers who are content with idleness. I find it absolutely fascinating that Jesus hits that kind of attitude head on, attacks it with a vengeance. We see that so clearly in the parable he told, the parable we call the parable of the talents. In that little story, Jesus makes it absolutely clear that wasted human effort is an affront to the Almighty. Jesus makes it abundantly clear that you and I have been given gifts and talents and skills and abilities in life, and that we are meant to use those things for God, to use them in God's service and to use them for God's glory. The parable makes that absolutely clear. Now what I want to do for these next few moments is to use the parable as a springboard in order to consider two very basic questions. The first question is this, is there any connection between Sunday worship and Monday work. The parable says, absolutely, yes, there is a connection between Sunday worship and Monday work. 
The great preacher Henry Van Dyke put it like this. Honest toil is holy service. Faithful work is prayer and praise. There is a connection. And that's the point Jesus was trying to make in this parable. By the way, I don't know if you noticed or not, but in the 25th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, this particular parable is placed right in the middle of a whole series of parables told by Jesus, and every single one of those parables has to do with the kingdom of heaven. And therefore, Jesus is saying to us in this parable that heaven has to do not only with what we do in Sunday worship, but also in what we do in Monday work. There is a connection between what happens here on Sunday and what happens out there in the world the rest of the week. I think it's worth remembering that back in history, during the time of the trade guilds, the carpenter's trade guild adopted as a motto the words of Jesus, I am the door. The carpenters made that phrase their motto, I am the door. And once they made the words of Jesus their motto, they then proceeded to make doors in a very special way. They began to make doors in the following form. In the upper portion of the door, they would cut out small recessed rectangular patterns. In the lower portion of the door, there would be longer recessed rectangular panels. You can see, can you not, that the placement of those panels, the shorter ones at the top, the longer ones at the bottom, resulted in a raised cross being revealed on the surface of the door, plainly visible. And I want to tell you, if you'll start noticing, you can find doors made that way to this very day. With the shorter recessed panels at the top, the longer recessed panels at the bottom, and therefore the door itself reveals the raised cross of Jesus Christ. Carpenters made doors that way because their motto was the word of Jesus, I am the door. The carpenters understood, you see, that their work was holy service. Their skills, a sacred trust. There is a connection in the mind of Jesus between Sunday worship and Monday work. And that is an attitude that we as Christians today ought to exalt. It's a beautiful thing when you find a Christian who is willing to do that. I had that experience not long ago. A member of this congregation called to tell me that he had moved into a new office and he wanted me to stop by for a visit. I did. We chatted for a while, and then he said, the reason I wanted you to come here is that I want all of the work that I do in this office to be for the glory of Jesus Christ. And so I want you to pray right now that God will bless this office and the work that takes place in it. It was a simple request. But do you understand it had quite literally world-shaking implications because that man was affirming the dedication of his life to Jesus Christ as the Lord of all. That's what we sing, isn't it? Crown him the Lord of all. 
We sing it, but do we mean it? The reality is that Jesus Christ is the Lord of all. And that man understands that to be true. He understands that there is a decisive connection between Sunday worship and Monday work. Some years ago, I was riding on the train from the city of Edinburgh in Scotland up to the city of Dundee. We were going there to play in a basketball tournament. The train came up toward Dundee from the south, and then, just as we reached the city, the train made a westward turn across the River Tay, the river on which the city of Dundee is built. It was late in the day, and as I looked out the train window, I saw the skyline of the city of Dundee silhouetted against the setting sun. Now understand, please, that the city of Dundee has no tall buildings. It is a city filled with textile mills, and it is a city which is known far and wide for the strength of its church life. And so as I gazed at the silhouette of the city of Dundee, I was rather startled to see a myriad of smokestacks and steeples. The city of Dundee is comprised almost entirely of smokestacks and steeples. And in that moment it dawned on me, and the impression remains with me to this day, that both of them, both the smokestacks and the steeples, point to God. The smokestack points as surely to God as does the church steeple. The message is clear. What you and I do every day of the week points as surely to Jesus Christ and to what Christ means to us as what we do here in worship on Sunday. There is a connection between Sunday worship and Monday work. I suspect that all of you know that the vast majority of people consider the best known verse in the Bible to be John 3.16, and I suspect that many of you can say that verse by heart. But I wonder if you've ever really stopped to think what the verse says. The verse says, God so loved the world. Notice, the verse doesn't say, God so loved the the church. It says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Jesus Christ came to this earth not simply to be the Lord of the church, but to be the Lord of the world, the Lord of the marketplace, the Lord of the legislative hall, the Lord of the prison house, the Lord of the executive suite, the Lord of the school, the Lord of the home, the Lord of all. Crown him the Lord of all. Jesus Christ wants us to understand that there is a connection between Sunday worship and Monday work. Jesus Christ is the Lord of both. He is the Lord of all. And that leads me then to the second question. How do you and I as Christians make that connection between Sunday worship and Monday work? I think the parable makes it quite clear that we, you and I, are to do whatever we can to build the kingdom of God on earth. Not to build the kingdom of God just in the church, 
but to build the kingdom of God out there in the world. You and I are blessed to live in the city of Orlando. We call it the city beautiful, and that it is. It is as beautiful a city as anyone could ever hope to see. But this city, for all its beauty, this city and her people are still hurting for love, hurting for justice, hurting for righteousness, hurting for a sense of meaning and purpose in life. And yet the wonder of it is that we as Christians have exactly that to offer to the world love and justice and righteousness and a sense of meaning and purpose in life. And so I believe that Christ is calling us to get our faith out of the church, out into the weekday, workaday world where God wants it. We tend to want to hoard it here. We love being in God's house. We love being in the presence of sisters and brothers in the Lord. But God is calling us to take the wonders and the glories of our faith out of the church and into the world. How do we do that? Let me be painfully blunt. It means that you and I have got to start mentioning the name of Jesus in the letters we write, in the conversations we hold, in the contacts we make. It means that you and I have got to be engaged in struggling for justice for the people of this city. In court, yes. At school, yes. Even at the supermarket. It means that we have got to let righteousness begin to prevail in our everyday living so that our word is always good and our promises are always kept and our honesty is never questioned. It means that we have got to begin letting our everyday language reflect our reverence for God. It means that we have got to let the joy of Jesus Christ that we know spill out of our lives into the lives of everybody we have contact with all during the week. Our customers, our clients, our teachers at school, the person who waits on us in the store, our boss, our employees. We've got to let the sheer joy of Jesus Christ spill out of our lives into the lives of everybody we meet every day of the week. I think maybe the best way for me to help you understand what that means is to tell you about a most extraordinary man. Several months ago, I was visiting in a retirement home. I was in the main hallway and I had punched the button for the elevator. And while I was waiting for the elevator to arrive, suddenly a rather tall, man walked up to me. He was somewhat frail, obviously much advanced in years. He walked up to me and he stuck out his hand and he said, isn't this a great day? 
I feel wonderful. How are you? And I replied, well, after that, I sure feel better. <laughs> Good, he said. That's what I was hoping you would say. You see, there was a time in my life when God had given me a number of gifts, and I loved using those gifts for God. But that's not true anymore. The only gift, the only talent I have left is that I can make people feel good. And I intend to use that talent every way I can. So, this is a great day. Have a great day and make the Lord proud of you. And with that, he walked on. I'm going to tell you, I stood there and I watched him hobble away. I thought to myself, That man's alone. I wonder if he made a difficult journey out to the cemetery and left his wife there. I wonder if he has children and if they ever take the time to make contact with him. As I watched him, I, I thought to myself, he's walking with a cane. His right leg can no longer support the weight of his body. I wonder if when he first started using that cane, if people ribbed him about his old age. As I watched him, I, I thought to myself, his teeth are really too straight and too full to be his own. And I wondered if it hurt to have that done. And were there those embarrassing days when his cheeks kind of sunk in while he was waiting for the new teeth to be ready? As I watched him, I noticed he was wearing a hearing aid. And I wondered if he had gotten to the point where he suddenly realized that every time he entered a conversation, he was having to say, could you speak up a bit? And when he first got that hearing aid, I, I wonder if his friends walked up to him and they noticed the hearing aid and then very quickly looked away so that he wouldn't notice that they noticed, but he noticed that they noticed. And I wondered if that was hard on him. So I watched him walk away. I thought to myself, he said time was when he had lots of gifts that God had given him and he used them and enjoyed using them, but that was true no longer. Now he had just one gift, one talent. I wonder, I wonder how painful it was for him to make that adjustment in his life. I watched him hobble off down the hall, and I thought to myself, that man is a hero. He walked up to a fellow he didn't even know, and he said, this is a great day. I feel wonderful. How are you? And then, he said to this fellow he didn't even know, have a great day. Make the Lord proud of you. As I watched him hobble off down the hall, I thought to myself, oh, the Lord is so proud of that man. And then I got to thinking, you know, not only 
and what he said served to inspire me. But what he said is actually a great watchword for living life these days. He said, remember, have a great day and make the Lord proud of you. What a man. And what a watchword for living your life every day. You see, that's what this parable Jesus told is really all about. We don't have to take God out into the world when we go on Monday. He is already there long before we ever leave the breakfast table. All we need to do is to recognize his presence there and acknowledge it. All we have to do is to mention God's name as we move through the course of every day. All we have to do is to use whatever gift God has given us, whatever talent we possess, to use it every day in God's service and for God's glory. All we have to do is to begin every single day with this simple little prayer. Lord, be with me today. And we shall then discover that that is exactly where God is. Pray with me, please. Great and gracious God, you sent Jesus Christ into the world not simply to be the Lord of the church, but to be the Lord of the world, to be the Lord of all. Help us by your power and by your grace to take our Sunday faith out into Monday's world. Amen.
Let me just share what I know to be true. That if you surrender your life in faith to Jesus Christ, then you will know in your life a joy which nothing in this world can ever take away. I know that joy, and I long for you to know it as well. If you've never made that commitment to Christ in your life, if you've never said, Lord, I want to follow you in my life every day, then let me invite you to take that single step of faith today. You don't have to know and understand everything there is to know and understand about Jesus. That can come later. But if you say today, I want to follow you in my life every day, then your life is going to be filled with a joy that nothing can shake or defeat. And one day, you will know the joy of entering the kingdom of heaven. If at some point previously in your life you've made that kind of commitment to Christ, but today you wish to unite with the membership of this church to be a part of this great, big, loving, joyous family of the Lord, I invite you to take that step of commitment today as well. In either case, all you have to do is when the service concludes, just in a moment now, make your way right here to the chancel steps. Mr. Ted Pierce is going to be standing right there. He's going to be ready to receive you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I invite you. Come. Let us pray. Almighty God, let there be peace on this earth and let it begin right here, right now with us. Now may the living Lord Jesus Christ go with you. May he go above you to watch over you, behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, within you to give you peace, and before you to show you the way, now and forever. Amen.